Uh, before we jump into tonight's topic, I wanted to give you an opportunity perhaps to you know, ask any questions or make any comments if you did get a chance to get into uh, this book called Lynchpin. All right. If you've got a chance to get into that, uh, I think it's a very good presentation of some basic uh, evidence of the resurrection, of resurrection apologetics, we saw that. One of the things that really jumps out at you that's so common sense and so obvious, for example, the shift from worship on the Sabbath to Sunday. I mean, the Sabbath day was so holy for the Israelites and had been since the time of the Exodus. I mean, we're literally, we're talking about a culture that for 1,500 years, 1,500 years, celebrated the Sabbath and that whole Sabbath concept. And sinning uh, against the Sabbath was punishable by death. It was equivalent to, let's say, blasphemy. And for that culture to, in a single generation, not over the course of time, but in a single generation, shift from not only not observing the Sabbath anymore, but changing the day they worship to Sunday morning because the claim that Jesus is risen from the dead. You know, that's just one of those little things that maybe we don't think about, but it's little stuff like that that I really enjoyed this book. So if you, if you just got it tonight, this is our gift to you. Um, the author is a Lutheran Church, Missouri Synod pastor. He's out of California, and I really think that you'll enjoy this book. All right, so tonight we want to piggyback a little bit about our topic from last week, uh, some of some resurrection uh, themes. But really what leads us into the, the next uh, topic is what the resurrection of Jesus means. And it means that Jesus is God. The resurrection of Jesus, that historical event, as we talked about last week, remember? We talked about the resurrection not being an article of faith, that you've got to have enough faith to believe that it happened. Actually, we simply accept the testimony that's been given to us. And that same historical event, the resurrection of Jesus Christ, then equals the divinity of Jesus. And even now, the divinity of Jesus, we talk more as a, we talk about it more as a, histor a fact in history than we do something that you have to believe. Does that make sense? All right? None of you, all the kids are gone, right? So none of you believe in Santa Claus, right? All right. <laughs> Santa Claus is, uh, did I ruin it for you, Dale? I'm sorry, bud. I say, you, you, you know, it's bound to happen. Don't tell him about the Easter Bunny. Yeah, Karen, <laughs> too late now. Well, you would agree with me that if you wanted to believe in Santa Claus, you've got to really believe hard, right? And I, guys, I got news for you. Christianity is not that type of religion. And I've got to really watch myself because I know that when I get on this train, uh, it makes it sound like I'm making faith sound less important. You know, like, oh, you, you don't need faith. We, we have we have facts. No, we do need faith. Faith is very much a part of our walk with God and, and how we, uh, in our relationship with Christ, I'm simply kind of making the point that when it comes to defending our faith, we do so not with the ability to believe and hang on to things like little kids do with Santa Claus, but we do so with facts that happen in history. And that's why we talk about these things as historians. Uh, speaking of historians, we kind of have that, uh, you know, when we're talking about this type of a thing, the resurrection of Jesus and the divinity of Jesus, both of them have this dynamic in common, and that is the proximity of the proclamation to the event itself. Remember, we talked about Jesus is risen from the dead roughly 30 AD, and they began to claim that resurrection immediately after, and just years, uh, at, well, immediately after that, but that the record of that proclamation and how close it is. When we get those right. events so close together, that's evidence of it truly happening. Because if it didn't happen, there's too many people around to say, wait, stop, that didn't happen. Same thing with now Jesus being God. Jesus is worshiped as God almost immediately after the resurrection. And when we have the dates here, Ignatius, look at that church, as a church father, he writes and tells us that Jesus is worshiped as God. Uh, then Justin Martyr picks up for that. Tertullian is another example. The point being, um, maybe you caught this in the Lynchpin book too. Remember the story about there's a myth about Jesus' uh, body being taken by a gardener. The gardener took the body mistakenly. The, they, they saw that the tomb was empty and proclaimed him risen. And the gardener came back and said, oh, sorry guys, here's the body. And they, they took the body of Jesus, then destroyed it, 
thus he is not risen from the dead. That myth actually took hold. But guess when it took hold? It's called the Toledeth Yezu. It's a, and that's it's part of a, it's in Zelt's book. You can read about it. But guess when that uh, myth began to take hold? The fourth century, four hundred years later. See what happens? The way that a myth works is you've got to wait hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of years to pass so that the people who are were still alive are dead and can't refute it. Right? Uh, there's the myth about the you know the wise men. We don't know how many wise men there are, but we think that there were three. And throughout the centuries, these little details have cropped up that they were what's what's her name? Balthazar, you know, what, Melchior, whatever, another one I can't remember. There's the myth that they represented all ages. One was 20, one was 40, one was 60. They represented all people. So, you know, one was this race, that race, and the other race. All of these things, all of these myths, you know, when they popped up 600 years later in the 6th century. Okay, why? Because you need that much time for these, these myths to happen. Uh, okay, there you go. So, sorry. So... I guess the kids are just running around. Jake's got him on the plane. <laughs> okay, Jackie's got him on the plane. Anne was sick. She just she was under the weather. Right. So that so that was at least there. I apologize. <laughs> I hope that all the texts that do pop up because my phone and I and my Mac are connected. I hope that none of them are super embarrassing. But you know, <laughs> you never know. Well, you might know when my tea time is later in the week. Basically, yes, and it texts up. So yeah. Anyway, all right. So. Kind of with that in mind, just kind of piggybacking a little bit more on some of these skepticisms, some of the things that are said about the resurrection are very, very creative, going to show how far people will go to deny uh, not only the existence of God, but what God does in our world. Uh, the stolen body theory, the thought that the disciples stole the body and then claimed Jesus to be risen. There was a time in which the tomb was unguarded. The tomb was not guarded. Uh, Jesus is buried Friday, roughly at sundown, so let's just say 6 p.m. The next morning, as soon as the sun came up, one of the first things that the Pharisees did, they went to Pilate and said, look, uh, put a guard on that tomb, otherwise the disciples will come and steal the body, and you know, then you're gonna have problems. So there's about 12 hours. That night, the tomb's not guarded. The disciples could have went in there, stole the body, and said, he's risen, the body's not here. The problem with that theory is, Every one of those disciples, except for one, died claiming that Jesus was risen. Um, it would not have taken, the, the body of Jesus would have been the most sought after, uh, whatever, piece of evidence in the history of, uh, and I'm not exaggerating, the, any, any event that's ever happened. Because he was such a polarizing figure, you would have had so many enemies that would have wanted to find the body it would have been almost impossible for the disciples to pull off the uh, the proclamation that, that he is risen. So that's the problem with that one. The wrong tomb theory, uh, it's, it's quickly dismissed. It's, they went to the wrong tomb. It wouldn't take them that long to find the correct tomb. Not to mention the fact that the tomb of Joseph of Arimathea, he was a very wealthy man. The tombs of those individuals were well known. The lettuce theory, that's that the uh, there was a gardener, people were coming to see the body of Jesus so much or the tomb, and they're trampling through the gardener's lettuce, and thus he moved the body. All right, that's another one. The swoon theory, that Jesus didn't really die. He was just uh, really, they thought he was dead. You know, it's kind of like one of those. Um, and, he, you know, in the coolness of the tomb, he came to. It's, uh, it's so ridiculous because the Roman government was really good at killing people when they determined to kill people. And so they had an execution there. The hallucination theory uh, that um, all the disciples hallucinated the same thing is easily dismissed. Uh, just another example of how ridiculous this goes. And then my favorite, the twin brother theory, that Jesus had a twin brother, also known as the soap opera theory, because that's what happens in soap operas. <laughs> that's, that's how they work. It's just, I love the quote here from Paul Meyer. Paul Meyer wrote this book, uh, In the Fullness of Time. It's a great resource. Uh, Paul Meyer, he taught at Western Michigan, uh, another, another one of our Lutheran scholars, actually. Uh, so it's really, he's a historian. And as a historian, he, he makes this point. Certainly these various theories stand as a tribute to human ingenuity. <laughs> I like that quote. Uh, the notion that the disciples stole the body while the Roman guards 
Um, oops, I went too far. The notion that the disciples stole the body while the Roman guards slept certainly strains the bounds of believability, and it certainly does. But let's remember, there was a time in which the body, the tomb was uh, not guarded. So the issue isn't, you know, how they get around the Roman guards. The issue is how did they pull off saying that he's risen, right, and then hide the body, and that that's, you really have to have more faith to believe that they're able to do that than you do simply the resurrection. Uh, Paul Meyer uh, writes this as well. Well into the second century A.D., and long after Matthew recorded its first instance, the Jerusalem authorities uh, continued to admit an empty tomb by ascribing it to the disciples stealing the body. And that's what uh, I'd written before. I referenced this last week. Justin Martyr, remember his dates, maybe it's about 200 years. Just think 200 years after the resurrection. Uh, and he writes this about 1, 1 AD, 150 A.D., Jewish authorities even sent specially commissioned emissaries across the Mediterranean to counter Christian claims with this explanation of the resurrection. Point being, if you're trying to explain away the empty tomb, what do what can we be very certain existed 30 in 30, 30 AD? An empty tomb. They're not, they're not showing the body. They're trying to explain the empty tomb. What that proves to us is that the tomb was empty. So then the question becomes, all right, well, what what, what, what event explains the evidence that we have? And that's kind of what we talked about last week relative to the resurrection. Tonight, what we're going to do is take a look at the divinity of Jesus as an historical event that happened as well and the, and the evidence behind it. We begin with uh, references from Josh McDowell. I showed you that real thick book last week, The uh, Evidence That Demands a Verdict. Okay, He's got an entire chapter in what he calls In Support of Deity, The Great Proposition. And if God became man, then we would expect him to. And then he kind of lists eight different things. It's a very uh, fascinating chapter. One of the things we would expect Jesus to do is speak the greatest words ever spoken. Right? If God became man, we would accept, expect him to say things that no other man could say, could get away with saying. And that's exactly what Jesus did. When Jesus says your sins are forgiven, who has the only authority to forgive sins? God. For example, if I sin against Joe, Myron cannot say to Jay, Jay, don't worry about it, your sin's forgiven. The only person that can forgive me is Joe. I sinned against Joe. We sin against God. God is the only person who can forgive. For Jesus to step up and say, your sins are forgiving, that is a claim for divinity. And people knew exactly what he meant when he said it. Or my other favorite, the Great Commission, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. We tend to gloss over that because it's part of, as we say, the Great Commission, and we need to pause for a moment and really just stop and think about what Jesus is saying. All authority in heaven and earth has been given to me. What? And this is the last thing that he tells his disciples. Now, as pastor, sometimes, you know, we, we take a call. For example, we had pastor here a, a few years ago. His name was Mark, Pastor Mark. And when Pastor Mark, you know, took a call, he, you know, kind of, we had a farewell banquet for him. He said, thank you for everything. And then, you know, he he moved. Can you imagine if Mark would have said to us, you know, uh, his parting words, guys, I'm leaving, but I just want, I want you to know this. All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Who talks like that? Now, maybe Mark does. I say, if you, if you, know, if you knew Mark, if you knew Pastor Mark, he was kind of an odd dude. Uh, no, I'm, I'm teasing. I'm teasing. We love Mark. He's doing great down there in Tennessee. Um, but you, just stop and think about that for a second. What, what kind of a human being says these things? Or, or this one, too. I love this one. Heaven and earth will pass away, but my words will never pass away. That means we, we all have opinions, right? We all have theories, okay? I've got a theory. It's not a very good one, but it, I strongly believe in it. Do you ever notice, for those of you who play golf, when you play golf and you miss a putt, and you can say, oh, how did I miss that putt? And then you get the thing back. So you grab the ball and you put the same exact putt a second time. You ever notice how many times you always make it the second time? It's the weirdest thing. You always make it. And I have a theory as to why that is. When you're putting it the second time, it doesn't matter if you make it or not. Because you're not keeping score. So you don't care as much. Now, that's my theory. Can you Now, when, when the Lord calls me home and I'm gone, guess what else is gone? That theory. No one's going to repeat it. No one's going to remember it. Okay, can you imagine if I said to you, hey guys, um, heaven and earth will pass away, but you know that theory I have about the second putt you always make? That's going to live forever. Right? <laughs> you would rightly say to me, Jay, you're an idiot. Right? <laughs> Who 
who talks like that? And the, you really, we really, no, no, <laughs> no, who says this? Who claims eternity for his words? I mean, if we really take a look at some of the things that Jesus says, you have to ask the question, um, only God could get away with saying these things or a crazy person, as, as we'll see here in a moment. Uh, this is a quote is actually from, uh, not McDowell didn't write this, he's quoting another author. Jesus' words have passed into law, they have passed into doctrines, they have passed into Proverbs. They have passed into consolation, but they have never passed away. What human teacher ever dared to claim an eternity for his words? Stop thinking about that. All right. The next part is the fact that Jesus is worshipped as God. And he is worshipped as God from the very beginning. Now, remember what I said about myths? It takes myths a while to develop. And there's the claim against Christianity that says, well, the disciples made up the fact that Jesus was God after he died. The fact of the matter, the evidence does not support that. The evidence that we have, historical evidence, again, remember last week I asked you, do you believe in the Roman government? And you all should good, yes, we do. We believe it existed. You believe that there was a Nero and a Claudius and a Julius Caesar. Yeah, yeah, yeah we do. By what tools, by what measuring stick do you believe that? Well, historians and how that works. The same tools, the same measuring stick tells us that Jesus is worshipped as God very shortly after the resurrection. And so it's not like it took 300 years and then a bunch of people say, hey, remember that carpenter from Nazareth a while back? Well, you know what we should do? We should say that he was God. It's just too close. We simply have the evidence that it's too close, beginning with this. We have a letter from a governor of Bithynia in 112 AD. His name is Pliny the Younger. Pliny is writing to Emperor Trajan, again, historical uh, uh, individuals, and Pliny is complaining about Christians. He's trying to seek counsel as to what to do with Christians. There were times in which the Roman government treated Christianity in different ways depending on the politics of the time. If it was beneficial to a Caesar to persecute and kill Christians because it elevated his popularity with the people, then he would kill Christians. It had nothing to do with whether or not the emperor thought that Christianity was right or wrong. It was simply a, pol a means, political means to an end. So that's why throughout history you see the, a variety of how to treat Christians. That's why Pliny is asking this question of Trajan because he doesn't know. Basically he's saying to him, hey, what kind of emperor are you? What do you want me to do with these Christians? How does it fit in with your political agenda? And he asked him. But in the, the, the point is, as he asked them, then something is revealed, that Jesus is being worshipped as God as early as 112 AD. He says that um, he's been killing Christians. There were so many being put to death that he wondered if he should continue to kill anyone, to kill, uh, anyone who was discovered to be a Christian, or just only kill certain ones. Uh, he explained that he had made the Christians bow down to statues of Trajan, and Pliny goes on to say he made them cursed Christ, which a genuine Christian cannot be induced to do, because they believe that he is God. In the same letter, he says that the people being tried, and these are Christians, um, they affirmed, however, that the whole of their guilt or their error was that they were in the habit of meeting on a certain fixed day before it was light, and that when they sang an alternate verse, a hymn to Christ as God. That was an early form of Christian worship, and worshiping Christ as God, very early uh, in the time. The other one is the Christian creed, and that was a uh, good chapter, a great chapter. I highly recommend you read that chapter in uh, Lynchpin about the Christian creed. Um, and this is uh, from Tom Zelt's book, primarily a, a summary of that chapter. For a long time, the creed was usually memorized, but not written. It was explained to the catechumens in the last stages of their preparations. The old Roman creed, I believe in God the Father Almighty, and in Jesus Christ, his only begotten Son, <coughs> our Lord, and in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Church, the forgiveness of sins, and the resurrection of the flesh. All right. um, this, is, this was spoken before it was written down. And when it was spoken then, it was repeated verbatim. Trying to think of oh here's a good example the pledge of allegiance right remember when i was a that's how you, that's, that's how you date yourself basically if you, you said the pledge of allegiance in school it gives you an idea of how old i am but when they taught us the pledge of allegiance it was a it was a of an exact form 
right? You didn't make it up. I, I pledge allegiance to the uh, United States, to the flag. But I can't remember now. <laughs> to the, right, and to the republic for for and to the republic that it represents. Right. 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 Now my point is, you don't change it, right? It would be wrong for me to say, and for the nation that it represents. Right. A big old nation with God as its leader. I can't say that. That's not how. That's not how it goes. You have an exact thing that, that you have to say it, and the same thing with the creed. You have an exact creed the way that you say it, okay? And as that is passed down, before this is written down, it has to take hold in the culture. Does that make sense? They, they didn't say that the, the Apostles' Creed, this old Roman symbol, okay, the old Roman creed, they didn't say this because a group of people decided to make it up, and now we've adopted it as our mantra. It, it grew organically because that was what was being said by the group of Christians shortly after Jesus' resurrection. Does that make sense? That's the difference between the Apostles' Creed and the Nicene Creed. The Nicene Creed was written in 325 AD at a town called Nicaea, thus the term the Nicene Creed, because the Christian church got together and basically said, how are we going to express Jesus being true God and true man? That was the kind of controversy at the time. Point being, long before this is written down, it is being said. And as it's being said, it's passed down verbatim. Uh, and Paul gives us evidence in that. 1 Corinthians 15, 1 through 5. And what's significant here, as Paul is writing, is how much this looks like, and therefore probably is, uh, the f a, a variation of, a form of, the first Christian creed. Now, would, now I would remind you, brothers, of the gospel I preached to you, which you received, in which you stand, and by which you are being saved. If you hold fast to the word I preach to you, unless you believed in vain. For I deliver to you as of first importance what I also received, that Christ died for our sins in accordance with the scriptures, that he was buried, that he was raised on the third day in accordance with the scriptures, and that he appeared to Cephas and then to the, then to the twelve. Now, if we break that up, all right, just go one, two, three, four. Let's do this. Re join me. Let's just read this in unison, starting with the phrase, died for our sins in accordance with the scriptures. We'll put our pauses in the appropriate spot, just like we do with the Apostles' Creed, and watch how easily this flows. Ready? Join me. Here we go. One, two, three. Died for our sins in accordance with the scriptures. He was buried. He was raised on the third day in accordance with the scriptures. He appeared to Cephas and then to the twelve. What's it sound like? Sounds like the Apostles' Creed, right? It sounds like what we do every Sunday. Uh, and it's more than likely that's what Paul is doing. Another reason we know that it's probably what Paul is doing is it's very different than the way that Paul writes. Uh, the New Testament was written in Greek. Paul writes this to the, uh, uh, the church in Corinth, I think I want to say about 45 or 50 AD. And so that's yeah, yeah, roughly uh, about that time frame. And the words he uses in this passage, as they're translated into English, uh, as received and delivered, they have specific technical meaning in the Greek language. And what that means is the way in which Paul received them and then he delivered them in the same exact form. He did not change them at all, right? So, like I said, he would have received the Pledge of Allegiance. He would have then given the Pledge of Allegiance word for word. Not a single thing would have been changed. Uh, that's significant when he uh, says that uh, in verse 3. For I deliver to you as of first importance uh, what I received. The other thing that's interesting is the words that Paul refers to. Um, it refers to receiving that set stock of information, as we said. And he's talking to a group of people that he spent a significant amount of time with. Also, we've got words that we see in other... Paul wrote 13 epistles. He probably wrote, he wrote more than that. In the New Testament, we have 13 letters from Paul to churches. So you, you can tell his style of writing uh, fairly uh, easily. And in this section, his writing is very uh, different than what he usually says. The phrase, died for our sins, is used by him nowhere else in all of his 13 letters, although he speaks of this concept quite often. He quotes the Old Testament in many places. Paul is forever quoting the Old Testament. And his favorite go-to line when he quotes the Old Testament is that Greek phrase below, kathos, uh, gregraftai. In, in just the book of Romans alone, it means as it is written. 
as it is written. In just the book of Romans alone, he uses that phrase 12 times. So that's his go-to phrase. You, you know how we have go-to phrases, right? correct? <laughs> so, you know, that's the way that, we, that the way that we write is sometimes the way we talk. So Paul has a go-to phrase. He does not use it here where he obviously would have. Instead, he uses that awkward phrase in accordance with the scriptures. And he uses it twice in accordance with the scriptures, in accordance with the scriptures. So this is more evidence that what Paul is doing is passing down an early Christian creed. Why is this significant? Because this creed is written shortly after Jesus' ascension into heaven and the claim that he's resurrected. Um, also, too, the phrasing of raised on the third day or the 12th, that too is uh, unique uh, from other Paul's writing. How early is this? Assuming that the year of Jesus' death was 30 AD, and Paul's conversion to Christianity would have been somewhere between uh, AD 33 and 36. And this we know from uh, Galatians and the history that's there. Now, you might remember last week we talked about the fact that we're not saying that Jesus is risen because the Bible says so. That doesn't mean we can't use the Bible as a historical document. Because historians believe in the existence of a man named Saul from Tarsus. They believe that from other historical sources. And so with that, then, the historians believe that Paul wrote a letter to the Corinthians. And we have it in our New Testament as First and Second uh, Corinthians. Historians believe that that is authentic, uh, written by a man whose name was Saul, then changed to Paul. Now, what you say about that, those words, whether they're the divinely inspired, that is an article of faith. But Paul writing those 13 letters is as historical as Thomas Jefferson writing the Declaration of Independence, if indeed. Did, Tom, did he write the Declaration of Independence? I, all, all my early American history I now get from Hamilton, so I don't, I don't know what's going on. But anyway, but you see my point, okay? That just because we, uh, you know, we're not saying that um, we're proving these things without the Bible doesn't mean we can't use the Bible as a historical document because there, there's a lot of history in that. So with that in mind, then, uh, Paul's conversion to Christianity would have been somewhere between A.D. 33 and 36. He visits Jerusalem specifically to meet with Peter and James, and he describes that uh, visit in Galatians chapter 1. Therefore, the earliest... He could have received this stock form creed was between A.D. 33 uh, or 36 and 38. That's the earliest that Paul could have received that. But even then, we're talking about six years after the fact. That's not that long. He was also in Jerusalem one additional time before he visited Corinth in 50 A.D. This means Paul received this creed sometime between 36 and 50 A.D., with the earlier date being more likely. That's just three years or six years after the event. If we allow a few years for its formation and its accepted use as a standardized way for a group to confess its faith, that means that this creed came into being as early as 33 AD and no later than 47. You see what I mean? That if we allow a few years for its formulation, before it can be formulated into a form that's passed down word for word, it's got to be said and spoken in the community. Okay? And so uh, if you allow for that, now we're talking now, Gary Habermas, the author I told you about last week, the guy from Warren, Michigan, uh, the guy at the Michigan State grad, uh, remember his book, The Case for Christianity? I watched uh, a YouTube uh, thing on him because he's got his own channel and stuff, and I watched one of his lectures. He makes the point. He believes that uh, he places the Apostles' Creed in its earliest form when it first began to be confessed six months after the resurrection. Six months after the resurrection, you have people saying, Things like, I believe in Jesus Christ, you know, his only son, our Lord, you know, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered our punch by that first Roman thing, six months after the fact. And why? Because that if that's what, that's the explanation that fits the evidence that's been, that's been passed down to us. So kind of fascinating. It's, I cannot stress enough just how important uh, that proximity is. And that's what Zelt kind of finishes the chapter on here. Um, the primary point of this chapter is not what the creed confesses, right? It's not, and again, but when it confesses it, right? The name of the class, well, I changed it. It was why we believe and not what we believe. It could also, I guess, be called when we believe it, <laughs> when we believe. Just how quickly this is uh, after the uh, event itself. Again, that proximity of the confession to the event. It is so close. 
uh, whether one believes Jesus rose or not, the evidence is strong that those who did believe it, believed it in the first half of the first century. The first half of the first century. Not, not 50 through 100, 30 to 50. Okay, that, that's just the same generation. And the same thing that we're saying about the resurrection translates to Jesus' divinity. That he is God. Number one, as we talked about, he was worshipped. He talked like God. He was worshipped as God. And when he was addressed as God, he did not correct people. Right? And that's, this was our, our text from last week. Uh, we talked about a Bible class, actually. When Peter says, you know, to Jesus, he asks, who do people say that I am? Because there's a lot of doubt or debate. Who is this carpenter from Nazareth who's doing these amazing things? He's talking like God. He's, he's forgiving sins like God. Uh, who is this guy? And Peter says, answers Jesus' question, I believe that you are the Christ, the Son of the living God. If Jesus is just a good teacher, if he's a rabbi, and that's all he is. He, he would shut down Peter immediately. Because what Peter is doing there by saying, well, you're God. He's created, if Jesus is not God, right? They both know their Old Testament. Jesus would look at Peter and say, don't shh. Don't say that. That's blasphemy. And then he'd say to him, Peter, where on earth did you get that idea? Did I, did I say something that made you think that? You know, the, he would... It'd be a totally different conversation because Jesus would be guilty. If he accepts that title, he'd be guilty of blasphemy. Peter, by saying it, he's guilty of blasphemy, both of which are punishable by death. Jesus not only shuts that down immediately, he basically says, guys, what on earth have I said that gives you, you know, the idea that I would accept this particular title? But he doesn't. Not only does he accept the title, he praises Peter for stating it. Blessed are you, Simon, son of Jonah, for this is, again, uh, who talks like this? Now, people have said that the disciples, uh, kind of in order to honor Jesus after he was gone, the disciples said, you know, it would be a great way to remember Jesus. You know, it would be a great way to honor his memory for all the wonderful things that he did is to say that he was God and will start worshiping as God. You know, that's the... Uh, uh, accusation against Christianity that Jesus as God was a creation of the disciples later on what's the problem with that particular reasoning would that have been a good way to honor Jesus memory if he was just a man a Jewish man who knew a Jewish rabbi who knew full well that to say you're God and you're not is blasphemy it would is that would that be a great way you know that's like it's like you honoring me when I'm dead. You know, it'd be a great way to honor Jay after he dies. Let's just say that he was an Ohio State fan. <laughs> That'd be a great way to honor Jay. Let's do that. He'd love that. He'd absolutely love that. Guys, if you do that, I don't believe in ghosts, but I will come back and haunt you. <laughs> I will come back and make your lives miserable. Okay, but no, in, in all seriousness. Now, so let, let's take let's take Jesus' family. Right, we got James, his half brother. Okay, he's got brothers and sisters. Okay, if he's not God, okay, and you've got his disciples who stand up and say, you know what, guys, we're gonna uh, remember Jesus. He's such a great person. Let's worship him as God. Who steps in and says, uh, uh, we're not doing that? Who steps in? Who steps in and does that? His own family. His own family steps in. So we are not going to let you just ruin the memory of our loved one by saying that he's a blasphemer because blasphemers go to Sheol. That is the Greek word, or the Hebrew word for hell. We're not going to allow, allow you to do that. You know, you're just going to stand up and that people are going to stand up for that. Not only Jesus, brothers and sisters, but he doesn't have any children, but they're, I bet he's got nieces and nephews. Okay. <laughs> they're going to stand up for him as well. And they're for, so if he's being worshiped as God in 112 AD, all right, so maybe not his brothers and sisters now. They can't make, because they're dead by now in 112. But guess who's still alive? Their kids and their kids. Jesus did not have any kids of his own. But you can surely believe as close as the Jewish family was, his brothers and sisters, and they're listed in Mark. He had a number of them. They would have had kids. 
And those kids would have had kids. And I don't know if they called them uncles back then, but you would have had Uncle Jesus. That's who you would have been. And you would have had then grand nieces and grand nephews. And guess who you're not going to slander to the grand nephew and grand niece? Grandpa. You're not going to say something about him that he would not have wanted to have been said. And you know how I know? I've got kids. I've got three kids. And I've got two nephews. And I'm their, I'm their godparent, uh, Francie's sons, Jake and Joel. Uh, Jake is the one who just got ordained. He's the pastor down in Knoxville, Tennessee. Uh, Joel is the, the, uh, the Chicago cop. And of those five kids, if anybody says <coughs> anything bad about Pastor Terry, they will cut you. <laughs> they will hurt you. They love that man so much that there is no way that anybody is going to say a single thing bad about Pastor Terry. From, from Leah to Becca to Joe to Joel and Joe, those five kids, they will find you, they will hunt you down, and they will make you take it back. Okay? So, you've got them. Jesus doesn't have kids, but I can guarantee that he's got nieces and nephew who love him that much. I'm, I'm, I'm speculating, but that's the way that Jewish families are. And if somebody steps up, Peter, James, John, Philip, if these people step up and say, you know what we're going to do? We're going to claim that Jesus claimed to be God. <laughs> That's blasphemous. And Jesus would have family members who love him enough to say, no, he's not. And guess when they would have said that? 112 AD, 150 AD, 175 AD, a hundred years after that. But what is, what, what's happening? Jesus is being worshiped as God almost immediately after uh, the, the, his ascension and uh, it, it, it survives those first 20 years when if it wasn't true it is a lie that is so easily quashed <laughs> you know we never hear we would never heard about it so so just the, the timing of it again Jesus being worshipped as God it is a fact that happened in history and we have the evidence that it comes down to us yes sure you mentioned last week that James was Jesus half brother yes like, where did that come in? Why, why half brother? Because Joseph and Mary had other children. Joseph and Mary would have had other children. Oh, before they even got together? No, no, a after Jesus. Joseph buries Mary. Right. Jesus is born. Right. But they had not been together yet because of the virgin birth. Okay. But after Jesus is born, Joseph and Mary... Uh, you see, Cheryl, when two people love each other. <laughs> Sorry, no, I, I couldn't help it. I just couldn't help it. No, no, no. Joseph and Mary had other kids. Yeah. Well, they're... No, no, because Joseph isn't Jesus. Joseph isn't Jesus. Joseph. Jesus does not have any Joseph DNA. It's just Mary and the Holy Spirit. So yeah, so that's why I typically say that there. The... Yeah, this is. I got this call. So my wife worked for a, a doctor there at, 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 uh, in St. Louis. When I, my wife put me through seminary, so that's how that worked. Uh, she worked. I went to school and played intramural basketball. So yeah, but, and now she works, and I and I play golf league. So the, the, some things never change, Myron. Some things never change. Anyway, Denise works at a. She's a receptionist. You no, know, she's kind of an insurance specialist at, a, at the uh, Heart Health Center. Blah blah blah. The office manager, her name is Patty, Gary and Patty Heap. Wonderful, great people, hung around with them all the time, but they're Catholic. And they're saying that there was like a real Catholic Lutheran vibe uh, there. And this was back when I was a young, and when you're a young pastor and you got all this theology that they taught you at the Sem, I mean, you just feel like, you know, Batman, right, with your utility belt. You just want to walk around and just take people out. Bam, bam, <laughs> bam. Heresy, bam, right? Uh. Anyway, so Denise calls me up one time because they're having an argument. Because the Catholic Church believes that the Virgin Mary stayed a virgin, and she never had any children, and so they're going, they're having this argument there, and so I'm, a, I'm a, in my office at church. This is back when we lived in Missouri. Phone rings. It's Denise. Jay, what are you doing? I said, oh, I'm just working here. It, it, blah blah blah. Well, so and so says that Jesus didn't have any brothers and sisters, and I said, what? <laughs> I thought that I thought that he did. I said, oh, Denise, put me on speakerphone. <laughs> so that's how they work. Yeah, they just let him have it. Yeah, it like, but anyway, but that that's kind of what, where that where that sometimes would come. Yeah. We, we believe that uh, they did have that. Yes. Question. Yes. Question, Myron. Yes. Where did the thirty AD come? I mean, why is oh we rounded up? 
We just rounded up the 30. Yeah, because you'll, you'll often hear, hear her 29 AD, but it's... it's. Why is it one? Oh. Well, Jesus was born in 4 BC, <laughs> and that's because of an error. Okay. It's, it's an error that has to do when, the, when, a, when a monk, about, I can't remember what century it was, when he went to put together the calendar, he made it, he quite literally made an error. He made a four-year error in going from uh, something about the founding of Rome versus, uh, I can't remember what the other event was, but it's something like that. Yeah, you can, I, it's one of those things I understood for like 10 minutes. Yeah. And then, you know, it's, it's, you know how you get, you understand stuff for like a minute and a half and then you forget it. And then you go back to it and, and you think, is that really necessary? <laughs> do I need to brush up on that again? But it has something to do, like if you're counting certain years and you start here, it's, you're gonna end up here. And this guy, he started here instead of here. And thus Jesus was born four years before Christ. 4 BC is when we had that birth. <laughs> Founding of Roman, I want to say death of Herod, something like that, but whatever. But that's why that is. Okay, so kind of with that in mind then, with that in mind, um, we have to look at Jesus' claim to be God, worshipped as God, and then did not correct it when he was worshipped as God. And the fact that he is worshipped as God uh, and, and promoted as God, you, you know, well into then, not just uh, uh, by the people around him, but by his people who knew him the best. So with that in mind then, basically C.S. Lewis, the great Christian author, comes down with well, more or less, we've got three options. He calls it the great trilemma. And that's, we have somebody who we know from history, Jesus of Nazareth, claimed to be God. Now, whether or not you believe that claim, that isn't as much the issue as we have to look at that claim at face value and ask a question. Who is he? And Lewis basically says, look, we've got three choices. Lord, liar, or lunatic. And the point is that he's saying is that um, what the world wants to do is to deny, since you can't deny that Jesus of Nazareth existed, but you don't want to insult Christians, well, you might end up saying something like, well, Jesus was a great teacher. Well, he's a great teacher. He did a great job. No, he wasn't really God. Uh, his disciples made that up later on, or that, that came to be made up later on. We have historical evidence that simply is not what happened. He was worshiped as God from a very early date, relatively speaking. And so you can't say that. And that's Lewis's point. He writes this in his great book, Mere Christianity. I'm, I'm trying here to prevent anyone saying the really foolish thing that people often say about him. I'm ready to accept Jesus as a great moral teacher, but I don't accept his claim to be God. That is the one thing we must not say. A man who was merely a man and said the sort of things Jesus said would not be a great moral teacher. He would either be a lunatic on a level with a man who says he is a poached egg, or else he would be the devil him, the devil of hell. You must make your choice. Either this man was and is the son of God, or else a madman or something worse. You can shut him up for a fool, you can spit at him and kill him as a demon, or you can fall at his feet and call him Lord and God. But let us not come up with any patronizing nonsense about his being a great human teacher. He has not left that door open to us. He did not intend to. You see, if Jesus isn't God and he's just a man, then either he's lying. And if he's lying, he either knows he's lying, which that's what Lewis means when he says then he's the devil himself. If he knows he's lying and he says, he, and he says he's God, then he's trying to lead people away from God. And the only person who does that is Satan. So this is either Satan incarnate. If, if he's lying, then it's Satan incarnate. Or he doesn't know he's lying because he's crazy. All right, he's a lunatic. And how many lunatics do you know that can speak this authoritatively, eloquently, and say the types of things that, as we said before, have been turned into hymns, poems, paintings, right? That's lunatics typically, uh, well, their, their, their lunacy does them in, <laughs> okay, kind of a thing. And so that's why I'm saying that, uh, now you might not believe he's God, but you cannot say he's a good, he, well, he's a great man. He's a great teacher. No, he's not. If he's not God, he's terrible. Is he? You say it himself because he's lying and he knows it. So that, that, that that's just not an option. Uh, so, Joe. I was just going to say then after 
who's a death and resurrection, yeah. which accuse the apostles of being the same thing. Yes. Like yeah. Heirs are the lunatics. The yep. great wisdom has made you a lunatic. That's yes. That, right? Yes. You know? Yes. Yeah, that's what he said to Paul. Right, he's made you mad, yes. He's made you mad. You, you, all, 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 all your study... They're all crazy. All your study has made you mad. I mean, you have to yes. say every Christian that ever came along and received this creed, it says again, Jesus appeared to 500, you had an instant 500 lunatics. The, the difference is, though, you would have had... Yeah, I'd be fair to call them lunatics if Jesus didn't claim to be God. Yeah. Because really then what you're accepting is his claim. Yeah. Because he claims to be God... And what you're saying is, all right, I believe this. Uh, I believe the claim uh, that, that you are making. And so, uh, so there, once again, so from here then, all right, we see kind of our stepping stones. We've got the divinity, uh, resurrection of Jesus, historical fact, leads us to the divinity of God, which now leads us to the fact that God exists and the existence of God. And that's where we go next week. And then here's where we'll get it, begin to get into more faith things. Because everything I've just told you has had witnesses. You know what the one event in all creation, or the, uh, I gave it away. The one event in all creation that doesn't have witnesses? Creation. That's it. The resurrection of Jesus has witnesses. Jesus' divinity has witnesses. There are people there who, 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 who heard him. They knew exactly what he meant when he said, your sins are forgiven. That, that claim to be God. Before Abraham was, I am. <laughs> you know, that the, the, there are people who heard that. So that next week, that's kind of where we'll go. Uh, with the existence of God.